In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I have a brilliant conversation with Brooke Jemison, the experience lead at Place OS. Brooke tells us about her background in mathematics and marketing, her passion for putting the user first, and how she fell into the smart community space. We talk about the importance of helping people to make sense of data and the power for us as adults of doing things that are difficult and that we're not good at but persisting anyway. Brooke then tells us a bit about her work at Place OS and why she chose to do further study in data engineering as well as why a focus on ethics and philosophy is such an important piece of the puzzle in all careers, but especially in technology. We discuss the importance of nurturing critical thinking and getting more diversity behind the code, as well as changing ways of working and the opportunities that come from proactively responding to disruption. We finish our chat discussing the emerging trends of platform versus product and UX versus UI as well as going beyond silos and screenshots when it comes to truly integrated smart initiatives. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Brooke. How are you today? Hi, Zoe. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to have you. And um, yeah, I'm so glad we met on LinkedIn and have been chatting ever since. So let's just jump straight into this. And can you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about? I have a very bizarre background. Um, So I studied pure mathematics at uni. um, And then when I graduated, I realized I didn't want to do maths for a bit. So I went to marketing and I worked in website optimization for an e-commerce company and built them up from really small to really large and worked out a lot of things about behavioral economics and how that fits in with website analytics and people's behaviors online and with digital platforms. Um, And then from there, I now work at PlaceOS as the experience lead. Um, And PlaceOS is a smart building, smart workplace, smart cities company. Uh, We're global, but I'm based in Brisbane, Australia. That's awesome. Um, Yeah, it sounds like I I also love maths and I nearly did a pure math degree, but then I was like, oh, I really want to talk to people, right? So Yeah. And look, I realized during my degree that I was never going to be the best at maths and it was pointless trying. But one of the things that I do really enjoy is talking to people about maths and helping people understand maths. I guess that's what I do a lot of during my job. I say it's talking to people to find the questions and talking to data to find the answers. But so much of it is just helping non-data people or people who don't see themselves as working with data a lot to understand the data that's coming out of the smart and connected space and how they can use that to improve what they're doing and then also make other decisions for the future. Mm. And I like how you said, you know, people that don't realize they're, I guess, working with data because we work with data every day, right? Everyone. Yeah, and I think a lot of people just get really stressed about it. Um, I think that's a lot to do with how people are brought up and educated and things like that. But a lot of people just have a lot of anxiety going in. So it's one of my favorite things to get someone that's pretty adversarial um, and show them what is actually going on under the surface. And I think when people start to really understand what's happening, they uh, really can start to engage with what's going on. And that engagement really helps them in future. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I've been doing um, some ver- some basic math tutoring. Um, well, one of my friends um, who's who's trying to get into um, a, a um, into the army, essentially. Anyway, they have to do all these things, and I've been really enjoying just seeing when um, she's like, "Oh, I'm not good at this." I did it, and I'm like, "That's not where we start." You know, let's just look at this, and she's like, "Is this really easy for you?" I'm like, "That's irrelevant. What's relevant is let's have a look. At, you know, we need to look in, see what what's what." have a look at what, um, you know, what's happening here and really explain it back to the basics. And I, I didn't think that I would really like teaching, but I really like it because I love it because, um, I get to see her go, Oh, Oh, okay. That makes sense now. Whereas when you go in with this anxiety and this stress, 
no wonder people get so, I guess, caught up in the fact that they're not good at math or not good at data. And I think that's when, you know, if we can actually help people to step out of that into something that's, oh, this makes sense to me now. Oh, maybe I can do it again another thing or maybe I can you know bring that to something else um yeah it's really powerful yeah and also the power in doing something that's really difficult um a few years ago I went back to ballet after about nine years off and it was dreadful everything hurt and it was so hard and I didn't have any of the muscle memory that I had when I trained when I was younger but it was one of the most valuable things I've done as an adult in terms of really powering through something that was dreadfully difficult and I was really bad at for a while before I started to get any sort of like light bulb moments or the pieces starting to fit together Mm. and I think it's really easy as an adult like at at school you're sort of forced to do things that you don't really like but as an adult it's really easy to just choose things that you can sort of just make sure you're good at before you start so I think it then (laughs) gets really hard for people to if they do feel really stressed or threatened by something how they can then make the most of that being really difficult and then work out how they can grow from that. I think once you start doing that, um, things pay off in a few ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm laughing because I'm pretty sure I said that exact sentence that um, I – you know, I choose things that I'm, that I know I'll be good at so that I'm always good at them. Um, but yeah, and we'll talk about this later. We're, we're both studying. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's hard when you're, when, yeah, it's, it's difficult, but then the reward afterwards is just so, so much more, I guess, fruitful when you can actually move through something that, um, and, and also remembering that you're a student in this, you know, that, time of you know when you're a consultant it's like you have to be kind of good at everything and you know you're doing the stuff and you have all the answers whereas when you're a student you have to remember that you're a student and that you're learning I think that's something that's one of the light bulb moments I've had it's like oh right I'm not supposed to know all of this straight away I'm supposed to learn this first yeah but also you don't need to know it and it's so much better to not know and then find out the correct thing than think you know something that's actually wrong Mm, and then be misinformed Um, I think so many aspects of the world would be improved if people were more fine with not knowing what something was and then able to find out information based on that. Yes. Okay. Um, That's, that's awesome. Sorry. I think I talked too much about me now. Um, Let's go back to you. What sparked your interest in this smart community space? I think like a lot of people, I really just fell into it. Um, So before I worked at PlaceOS, I worked for a traditional AV company um, and then I was headhunted to work at PlaceOS. But at the traditional AV company, it always puzzled me how difficult it was to get things to work sometimes. Um, I don't know if you've ever been into these really complex boardrooms with really complex AV setups that are really just, there's a lot going on and there's maybe one or two people in the whole building that know how to make it work. That always puzzled me. Um, So I really got interested in things being connected and the user coming first, that aspect of the integration things that happen at PlaceOS uh, when I started working here. Um, And it's gone from there as well. I've always had a really big interest in using data to make active decisions rather than sort of just hoarding it in a garage and not doing anything with it. So, um, yeah, it's just a lot of things coming together, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, AV, we're talking about audiovisual there um, just to... Just to clarify, because I talk about AV, autonomous vehicles, so I just want to... Oh, yeah, no, AV is in audiovisual. But I didn't realise until I worked in the space how complex some of these systems are Mm. um, and the different hardware that goes into it is amazing honestly the the amount of work that goes into it and most people just don't know about it because they don't know how to make it work or they haven't seen it or like I said there's only a few people in the building that know how to actually get something to work so everyone else is pretty shielded from it Mm. Um, yeah but it's really really complex and there's so many different moving pieces and people working really hard to get to what is essentially a perfect outcome in terms of getting all of the different like sound design things and different picture quality. There's just so much going on, but it's often doesn't put the user first, um, which is one of the things that I'm really passionate about doing now. Mm -hmm. So what is a smart community to you? So my whole thing is that when things just work, um, one of my favorite Instagram accounts is called Public Domain Revolution. um, And they get all of this art from many years ago that's now in the public domain Um, And they sort of showcase it. It's really interesting because you get to see not necessarily like the really big pieces from the past, but there's so many interesting pieces that were really important at the time. And it's a good way of bringing them to the surface. Um, And they have this series, it's called a 19th century vision of the year 2000. And it's by some French artists around the turn of the century. 
and they're all imagining what the year 2000 will look like. Um, everything's flying. There's a bus with a whale strapped to the top of it. <laughs> just very, very off the mark. Um, but it's so off the mark because it's just absolutely nothing really even like what we think of the disruptive players in tech at the moment. Like Uber doesn't bring you a flying car. Uber just gets you a car when you need one at the specific place that you need. And it's easy. Like Airbnb is not a hotel in the cloud somewhere. It's just a place to stay that is easy and you can connect with the community. So I think so much about what we thought tech would be like versus what smart communities and smart buildings are like now is just things actually working. The notion of integration coming together to actually improve the experiences of users in the space rather than a flying car or a whale bus. Mm, mm. Oh, the old whale bus, yes. Oh, I will send you a photo after this. It is truly wild. Yeah. They're underwater as well. It's just, yeah. <laughs> Please do. And yeah, I think you're right. This, like, it just works is is something that I guess we take for granted, right, when when it does work. Um, and then we we forget about the times when it when it didn't or it didn't even exist. So we didn't even realize it didn't work for us. Right. And I think that's one of the really big differences between a smart home to a smart building um, and then to a smart community as well. Obviously, if you have Google Home or Amazon Alexa, and then if this and that, you can get a lot of things integrated in your home and you can get really good experiences based on that. However, the thing that comes into play is scale and security, which is what happens when corporate real estate is involved. Um, and so much of what we do with our real estate clients is showing them that this is what their tenants expect for experiences and how can we enable that to happen. Um, tenants don't always realize how much harder that is to get something that's a robust solution that actually works at scale in tenancies across different countries and many, many buildings. So it's our job to sort of make that look effortless in a way when really it's not. And I think that's one of the big things that leads to a lot of vaporware in the space. So products that don't really do anything, but it looks like they do. It's because they're lacking that integration aspect to actually allow things to work together. Mm. So why do you think the smart community concept is so important? I think it's really important because it creates better spaces for the people in the space. Um, like I said, it's really easy to get caught up on a flying car or something like that. But things, basic things like Let's dial up or dial down the HVAC usage of a space based on how many people are there or how many people are connected to the Wi-Fi, which really reduces your energy consumption. Or it's one thing in a workplace to have a wellness program that gives you yoga at lunch, but what would actually be better is halving someone's commute time that will increase their wellness at work. So lots of things about just getting back to the people and the space and how they connect and then working out how you can optimize that through technology is really important. Mm. Yeah. And I think that is a real key there. Um, when talking about yoga and, you know, the commute time, it's actually thinking beyond the traditional um, as well. Like, you know, and I guess like even yoga at lunchtime probably isn't status quo these days. Um, but I often think about, well, that that's that's awesome and, um, yeah, maybe that would be suitable for some people. But for others, it's like, well, maybe if I could just finish work on time, I could go to my local yoga studio and, you know, and, and experience that myself um, and I could organise that myself. So, yeah, I do think that yeah. there's, there's this um, thinking beyond what is not even traditional but just thinking beyond what is work to, um, you know, what – the quality of life of people and, and how that integrates in with all the other things that we do. And thinking holistically as well. Um, I think you can just think of, especially like for a corporate real estate, a tenant, you only think of their life when they're in that tenancy in the building. So they're in the floor maybe that they're renting, but what about that same tenant when they're in the cafeteria or what about that same tenant when they're outside? Can they still connect to secure Wi-Fi, things like that? Um, bringing it back to what are the actual holistic journeys of the people in the space and making note of where they start and finish, I think it can get really short-sighted where you just hyper-focus in on one specific section of that, which you might end up with a great solution for, but that's not as good if it can't flow in with the rest of their day and their journey. Um, and there's so many opportunities to give people, like you said, the agency to make choices for themselves. And that is so freeing, but often not really available for a lot of people in a lot of situations. So using tech integrations to enable that agency and freedom of choice, I think is really good. Mm -hmm. So tell us about um, the work that you do. We've obviously started um, a little bit there, but yeah, tell us tell us about things you do. 
Yeah. So anything specifically that I've done in the last two years, I can't actually really talk about because everything's really protected under NDAs. Um, but PlaceOS has clients across Australia and globally. Um, and we do everything from smart buildings to smart workplaces to smart precincts and working away up to smart cities when we get um, some people who are interested in, which we are getting now. And it's just a matter of um, we approach the problem in a different design format and then work out how we can get the tech integrations to align with the user experiences they want in the space. Um, and that can expand, extend from so many different companies who are interested in getting involved and then working out all the relations between those. Yeah, wow. And you're you're also we're just um, swapping stories about studying. Um, how, how's that going? It's a lot. Um, so I'm doing a graduate certificate in data engineering at ANU. Um, so it was part of the government's. I posted on LinkedIn when I found out about the program. It's the Higher edu Education Relief Fund or Relief Program. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially because of COVID, the Australian government uh, reduced the price or subsidized them of many courses that it thought was important for innovation. Um, and so my certificate was one of them. So it was heavily subsidized, which is really good. The downside is that Everything has to be done within six months. And then on top of that, my university has run it as two mini semesters. So each semester goes for only six weeks. Wow. Um, so instead of doing it over six months, they've decided to do it in essentially 12 weeks, <laughs> which is a creative choice. Yes. Uh, <laughs> um, but I, I've gotten through over half of it already um, and it's going really well. So it's just a matter of finding the time in amongst everything else to do that and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Mm. Can can you share a little bit about why you chose to do, um, you know, this further study um, in data engineering? Um, so I was actually supposed to move to New York for one of our clients in April at the start of this year um, and then the apocalypse happened. So that's been put on hold for a while until it is safe to go. Um, but as a result, I had cancelled all of my plans for the last six months of this year, I hadn't made anything because I assumed that I wouldn't be in the country. Um, and so I saw myself with a lot of free time and I really wanted to make the most of that with something that would give me more of a platform in future. So I do have a um, Bachelor of Science with an extended major in maths and I did already start my Masters of Financial Maths many years ago, but I really wanted to do something specifically with data engineering because I had experience programming in several languages, but I hadn't gotten anything written in paper from a university to say that I can do that. Um, so I wanted essentially a way to extend on what I already knew development-wise and then make sure that wrapped in with everything else that I was doing. Um, but one of the subjects I'm doing now is called data mining. And we wrote a whole essay on sort of the ethics of a data mining project. And I got really, really interested in one of the sources that I was using. Um, her name's Julia Powell. She's a law professor at the University of Western Australia. And she also has a um, nonprofit, which is all about like the future of tech law and privacy and tech for people, by people, and really enabling the agency of individual people to be aware of their data privacy and things like that. And I got so interested in it and I didn't expect I would at all. Uh, but her work is really good and I really recommend everyone Look, if you're interested in smart communities in any way, um, or even just tech in general, I think she's got some really good points of view that haven't made their way into at least my LinkedIn feed before this. I haven't seen any of her work, but I really, really enjoyed reading about it. Mm, that's so interesting. And yeah, I'm definitely finding the same. I'll um, I'll be doing a, you know, just a, which I don't know about you, but it's 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 a blessing and a curse because you get really interested in it. So then it takes you so long because you're just like trying to find everything out about it when all you need to do is write, you know, the essay, right? Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm also finding that that I'll do one, I'll do a subject and yeah, then I'll go down the rabbit hole and be like, oh, actually, I really, really am interested in this. And data mining and privacy is definitely one of those. Yeah. And it's one of the things that I think universities do a really good job of teaching um, sort of I can have and can learn lots of different programming languages online, but it's really, really good to go into in-depth analysis of the ethics involved at a university level. I think that's one of the things that stresses me out a bit about how university funding is changing in Australia, but I think the focus that does exist on ethics and philosophy are really important and it is a really, really important piece of the puzzle in all careers, but especially in tech and maths and things like that. 
Mm. I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, what you were talking about earlier about being holistic, you don't be, it, you, the only way that we can have these smart communities is to be thinking holistically. And thinking holistically is not learning, yeah, like several programming languages. It's learning those and then realizing what that means for a community or what else can I bring in here to make this a richer, more, um, you know, ethical experience for people. Um, and I, I think that's where, yeah, we, we, we really need to think about that when we are doing, you know, when we're studying, but when we're offering these as well on the other side of the teaching um, and, and really bringing in those different points of view um, because otherwise, yeah, we just get caught up in our own bubbles of, you know, whatever it is um, and, you know, algorithms don't help that either. And so then we just go round and round in our own little bubbles and and that's, that's not what the smart community is, right? We don't want to end up with one person in the whale bus cruising around. Um, we, right. we want something that works for, um, you know, the people also with the most at stake, you know, not everyone's going to be able to afford that whale, bu- whale bus. So I think, um, yeah, you're so right, bringing in those other aspects has to be part of our degrees of the future. Yeah, and I think making sure everyone is equipped with them. I think especially you alluded to algorithms earlier, but um, so much of the ethics around AI in what we use in training data sets and other things like that, so often that's sort of thrown to the side as in like someone else can deal with that um, rather than it doesn't always seem like everyone involved in the process is really championing the flow on effects of what they're doing. And I think that's led to many problems in the past, but it's something that we could fix in future and just making sure everyone's on board at a base level of what is actually going on under the surface and what that means for the wider community and stakeholders and things like that. Making sure everyone's equipped to analyze and understand what's going on so that it's not just given over to someone else. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. I think there's, um, we need more diversity like behind, you know, behind the code. um, So then we can have more diversity in front of the code, I guess. and yeah, it's something I've been thinking about quite a lot in doing machine learning course at the moment. Um, and it's it's super interesting. Um, but yeah, it's getting my the other side of my brain working with um, lots of math. Um, but yeah, just like the application is one thing, but then actually questioning is the other. And I think particularly, I don't know, um, when like when I was younger, you know, I was always the questioner. Um, and and that can be quite a that can be a seen as a negative thing on the other side because you're always asking these questions but we need to bring out that curiosity bring out that creativity and really support that because if we don't then those things don't get questioned and then they're mainstream and then they're beyond questioning well actually I don't think anything's ever beyond questioning but you know we get to that point where it's ubiquitous and and we just accept it so yeah I I totally agree with you I think we want to bring in more of that just like nurturing critical thinking, I yes. think is so important. Um, and that really does flow on to, into so many aspects. And everything we were talking about, about a holistic solution and using tech with empathy and doing human-centered design, all of that centers around understanding someone else's wants and needs and then applying that with the critical thinking through everything else that you're doing as part of the project. Mm. Um, it's just, yeah, this holistic notion of education, which is really hard to do at scale, but I think it's really worthwhile. Mm-hmm. And I also think it's not just like you know you don't have to go to uni necessarily um, to get to get that, but that more holistic view of how how do people learn um, and and maybe it is online. You know, for me, I need somebody to be telling me that there's an assignment that I'm going to get marked on it, and you know that there's the timeline. But I know for other people, it might be something more practical. Maybe they're doing a hands-on, you know, building sensors course or something like that. I don't know. Um, but I think that uh, yeah, it's it is bringing in all those different ways that people learn as well um which is something else I've been thinking about and I think there's a difference between qualification and certification and I think Mm -hmm. as education gets more disrupted due to COVID and just new ways of working and other things like that I think that will come into the spotlight a lot more um, and we'll sort of think about what people what is the role of different types of education and how other things can be opened up for more people Um, because my whole thing as well is I'm really really passionate about not only women, but women from regional Australia getting involved in tech. Um, it's not that women from regional Australia don't use tech. It's just that they're often not really included in the development of that. So um, I grew up in regional Australia. I know you did too. So it's just all about 
there's so many voices that I think we would know personally that could and should be brought into the conversation and just paving the way and making that easier for other people coming into the space. Yeah, I totally, totally, totally agree with you. And it's something I've been thinking a lot, a lot about. Um, one, studying um, remotely uh, is, you know, something I've been doing. But um, and I know there's, you know, there's definitely pros and cons um, for both. But actually, the access it is it enables and it opens up is um, just. And but obviously, we need that digital divide to close first, right? Because we need people to be able to have that you know, high speed, high quality internet connection because, you know, I'm having a great time studying remotely, but it's because I have, you know, a fast internet connection. Um, whereas you, you, if you don't, then then it's nearly impossible. Um, but I do think there's different ways that we can open that up and, um, and work from, and I think, you know, you were talking about before, thinking about the user experience. Um, I think, yeah, it, it will be disrupted and we will be looking more, well, how does it work for this individual student? And that will be, it, once that comes to the focus, and, and I think um, different universities are doing things in different ways, when that becomes the focus and realising that, you know, where where the experience is about the student, then I think we'll see these things open up, we'll see these things change, the, the I guess, the in-person um, I, it will still be there and it will still exist and it will still be really valuable, but I think we'll, it will be, um, I guess, a supplement or a um, augmentation um, to the, the remote experience where people cannot go to somewhere in person and that that experience is not shouldn't be thought of as less than or less prestigious or less whatever um, because you're still getting the information, you're still getting that, you know, the knowledge, you're still building all of those core skills. Yeah, definitely. And I think, look, it would be really, really difficult to be a lecturer in this situation as well, um, because coming from mm -hmm. two predominantly research universities, um, there's a lot of pressure on academics to be academics. Um, so it's their job to make papers in good journals and things like that. And often they're doing that at a time where they're also trying to change the student experience and trying to adapt to disruptive things happening within you know COVID and everything mm. else that's happened and I think there's a lot of moving pieces at the same time and it would be really difficult to sort things out and work out what's actually happening under the surface and there's changing priorities and there's changing expectations I think that would be really difficult so I my biggest thing is that um, when universities really embrace and universities as in administrations not necessarily the teaching stuff but really embrace technology and the holistic experience of everyone at their campus I think things mm -hmm. will change a lot as you can grow and adapt to what people now expect and what people really need to succeed as well mm. you're so right um and yeah definitely it, it's something that it's 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 um nearly this incorrect like it's an incremental change over time but it can be like this really dramatic shift and actually if you've never taught online before and even yeah the engagement um some work I'm doing at the moment is looking at that and what people are saying and um yeah it, it's it's definitely a uh a very challenging time for everyone but yeah if you're trying to still engage with people um in that remote and and using technology like it's not just like you were talking about before it's not just like oh yeah you just you know the setup the av setup's done and you know there you go there's so much in there's so much more than that there's so much there's so much nuance um in digital etiquette um what i call digital hygiene but then your setup and and how all that works and also that you don't actually know unless you know you go and have and, and well it's really hard to know like what the experience is on the other end. So even when we're having this conversation now, I don't know how I'm sounding to you. I sound fine to me. I don't know how I sound to you. I don't know how I'm looking to you. What are you looking at? What's distracting you? Is there a noise? Is there a whatever? Because I can't hear that other end. It's something I've been thinking about quite a lot of that, you know, when you're in person, obviously you can kind of, you know, see what's going on. You can kind of feel the air. You're, and you're all experiencing the same thing. But on the other end, and, and sometimes you won't even know. You'll never know um, because because we're not following up or, you know, no one's telling you. Um, you're not getting that feedback. Right. And I think overall with education but also the changing ways of working, the really good thing about things getting disrupted or something feeling like it's falling to pieces is that you can put it back together the way that makes sense. Um, so there is an opportunity and I think a lot of 
different types of organizations have made the most of the opportunity to really get in and change things Mm -hmm. and make some positive changes in what they're doing and reassess what they're doing and work out, oh, is this this just the way we were always doing something or is it the best way? And I think coming out of COVID-19, I think that's something that will really shape the future is the organizations that just let it happen to them and the organizations that realized there was a lot of things changing and then worked out how they could make the most of that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, that's really, really interesting stuff. But I'm going to move, let's move to the future and let's talk about emerging trends. So what are some of the emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough? Not even necessarily emerging trends, but a lot of what we talk about at PlaceOS is all about platform, not product. So so much of what we do is educating people. Uh, we need to educate our customers in order to sell to them because often people don't understand enough about what's going on to do that. Or we need to educate suppliers about why they need to give us API access or why we're open source and what that means for them and all sorts of different things like that. So empowering them with knowledge. But one of the big things we educate people on a lot is the idea of platform. So PlaceOS is a platform that you can build experience on top of, but the whole baseline of everything being connected into an ecosystem and then layering other things on top of that is really different to the sort of like Band-Aid product thing that we see a lot of. So when people just want an app for something, but the app doesn't really connect to other things, um, the idea of these little Band-Aid solutions that maybe look great in some screenshots on a PowerPoint, but they don't really solve an ongoing problem and they don't really fit into the ecosystem. So I don't think that's particularly groundbreaking as an emerging trend, but it is something that we spend a lot of time talking about it. Um, And another part of this as well is that UX is not UI. So, so much of what we talk about when we say user experience, I think people have seen so many stock photos of uh, mobile phone screens drawn on post-it notes (laughs) that they think that that's what UX is. UX is not always about the screen or what the app looks like or what's displayed somewhere as part of the user interface. Uh, user experience is about that holistic journey that we were talking about and how all the pieces fit together and how we can improve the lives of the users we're working with. Um, So that's sort of how that all fits together. But um, tech-wise, one of the ways that we see that happening as well is with IPv6 and Thread Protocol coming up. So this will make a huge difference in how especially real estate companies uh, can meet tenant expectations with tenant experience. And it's just essentially it's a networking protocol that is based on internet standards and it helps you converge technology that was previously siloed. So lots of the time in smart cities as well as smart precincts, there's sort of a lot of different tech systems that work really well, but on their own as a silo. So maybe the lifts are really good, but they don't talk to anything else. Or there's a visitor platform that doesn't really talk to anything else. Or there's really good Wi-Fi, but there's, it's really difficult to connect to. So this idea of convergence through a platform using these new protocols that are coming into play more and more, I think will be really good in how real estate companies and organizations in general can implement modern tenancies in a way that reduces cost, but actually gives a holistic experience to the people within the built environment. Um, in a way that's actually sustainable over time and really scalable as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, no, totally. And I was just thinking it's like, you know, beyond the silos and screenshots, um, it's, yeah, that holistic journey that we were talking about earlier. And I think it is, I would say it is an emerging trend because um, it needs to be, right? We need this in our smart communities. Right. And at the moment, it seems to be a matter of the Uh, internet service providers allowing IPv6 traffic. Um, There's hardware that can do it. It's just finding internet service providers that will run it. So, um, But there's a lot of really good organizations working towards this happening and it is getting more and more traction. So I think that is one of the things that we're definitely preparing for with a lot of our client base um, and it is getting people really interested. So that is a space to watch as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's been so great to chat with you. I just have two last questions. Um, The first one is what are some of your favorite smart community resources? So what do you listen to? Who do you follow? Um, What are you reading at the moment? I don't really stay in touch with any smart community stuff other than your podcast, because I think it's really important to not have blinders on in that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I was saying earlier, my biggest thing with the future of this is calling other people into conversation. So I think it's much more worthwhile to be looking at, like my favorite podcast is Pivot with Scott Galloway and Kara Swisher. 
And that's just generally about tech and culture and different types of like the aspects of law and politics and everything on tech. And I think that that's really important because it gives you a really thorough base of understanding when it comes to really getting to know the actual players in the tech industry and how they've made decisions and why they've made them and what's that led to in future. I think there's so much to be learned from that that you can then apply to smart communities. But I think it's a really good source of information just because it, it just because it doesn't say smart community in the title doesn't mean that you can't take learnings from that and apply them. I think that's really valuable. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other person I've mentioned I've been reading a lot of her work is Julia Powell's um, from UWA and futuresense.org. Um, and all of that is about data privacy and agency and the power imbalance and really getting accountability through, which as an open source company um, who really champions the privacy and security, that's something that's really important to me at PlaceOS um, and working out how I can ensure that in future work we're doing, but also how I can educate our clients about that. Because like I said, so much of what I do is actually educating people and helping them understand what's going on. So I think that's really important. Mm, yes, I agree. And I, I, I totally, um, yeah, thanks so much for sharing those resources. Um, and I'm going to go and um, follow follow them for sure. Um, I, I think privacy um, and ethics is such a huge piece. But I was going to say, yes, I'm listening to Talking Machines at the moment, which is all about oh, cool. machine learning. Um, and it's it's fun. It's a nice, it's, it's, it's a really super interesting podcast. They get super different, like people on all talking about, you know, AI, the future of AI um, right. machines. Lex um, Friedman's AI podcast is really good as well. Okay, cool. Good. Uh, yeah. I need more AI podcasts in my life because I just <laughs> need to, although to be honest, I haven't been listening to podcasts that much because I don't have a commute. So I need to weave them back into my my day a bit more. Yeah, definitely. I'm a big fan of a fake commute if you're working from home. Yeah. It's something I've always done when I'm working from home, but I leave the house and I get ready and I even pack my bag and leave the house and come back in. Um, I think it's really important just for getting your brain ready to deal with the day. I think that's really important. Um, mm. So, yeah, definitely take advantage of the fake commute. It is very underrated. <laughs> Will do. Um, yes, I I do do like I go out my go to yoga and then I'll come back and so that's kind of like my little my little tiny commute. Um, but I do think I need to. I don't know, separate out when because my office is like right near my bedroom. So I have to like, I don't know, maybe walk around the front of the house and come back in or something. Yeah, even just like exiting and re-entering the space is so important. It sounds very woo-woo, but it does help in (laughs) the longer you do it for, it does actually really help in just helping your brain to segment between things. Um, I think that's really healthy and sustainable as just a general work practice long term. Okay, I like it. I'll take that (laughs) advice. I'll let you know how it goes. Um, Brooke, it's been so great to chat with you. Thanks so much for indulging me um, and talking about uh, education and buildings and user experience. And um, I've learned so much from you um, and I really look forward to our next conversation because I think we've got lots to chat about and, yeah, lots lots of things that um, that I think we can, yeah, have great conversations about but maybe do some exciting things as well. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for having me. It's been super fun. Um, great way to start my Monday morning. Um, and yeah, I actually, I just have one last question. Can't miss this one. <laughs> How can people connect with you? Um, so the best way is on my LinkedIn, which is my name, Brooke Jamison. Um, Place OS also I post on there, which is just Place OS on LinkedIn. Um, additionally, my boss, John McFarlane, is the co-founder of Place OS. Um, he also has more a different approach to the content that we do like we do sort of different things about the same topics um so if you don't like my content you'll probably enjoy his more um and we've just posted a job on his profile as well so that's useful to check out if anyone would like to work with us Um, and then outside of that absolutely not related to smart communities but also my instagram if you would prefer more fashion-based content and nothing less about tech (laughs) nice i also have an unrelated instagram account um it's all about traffic signage I think it's really healthy to I think have so. an outlet or something that's, I think it's really easy to get focused so much on one specific thing. So I think it's important to have different facets to yourself. I will be checking out your traffic signage. Yes, I actually, 
it's it's a pretty um I, I'm not I'm not super uh, good at Instagram because I only do it when I'm traveling so I feel like that's when I have time so I'm gonna have to go back and go back into the archives and start posting things and reliving you know when I was in New York or when just I was go traveling with Google Maps <laughs> yeah oh yeah then I can find cool signs I'm sure yeah. I could Anyway, it's been so great to chat with you and, yeah, no, I really appreciate your time and, um, yeah, I look forward to our next conversation and I'll see you over on LinkedIn. Yes, definitely. Thanks (laughs) Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Are you looking for an engaging speaker, MC or facilitator for your next big event? Then we've got you covered. Zoe is a go-to speaker, MC and conversation facilitator with a difference. She's a master at simplifying the complex and making connections you might never see. Book Zoe for your next event. Email hello at mysmart.community or head over to her speaker page, www.mysmart.community forward slash speaking. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.